I'm Dr. Julie Young, an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Lethbridge. And I'm a visitor here on Treaty 7 territory. So I want to begin by acknowledging that we're living, studying, and working on Blackfoot territory, and would like to give recognition to the Blackfoot people, past, present, and future. Moreover, I want to insist that this is a central and ongoing question that we should be considering in the context of a discussion on displacement and dispossession. So thanks to the Galt Museum for inviting me to engage with this exhibit. It's really exciting that we have it here in Lethbridge. In addition to being a geography professor at the university, I'm also a Canada Research Chair in Critical Border Studies with a focus on the navigation of displacement and asylum in border communities. So today I'm going to speak briefly about Canada's place in the global refugee regime, which is examined in this exhibit. So let me take you back to 2015, when the scale of displacement due to the ongoing conflict in Syria really hit global consciousness. So many Canadians, I think, became aware of the scale of the crisis in Syria when images of Alan Kurdi circulated in September 2015. And this map that I'm showing on my slides, produced by the UN Refugee Agency in 2015, showed that at the time, more than 11.5 million people had been displaced by that conflict, including 5.6 million refugees, so people who had managed to actually flee the country, and 6.6 .6 million people who were internally displaced, so they hadn't actually managed to leave the borders of the country. And at that time, the scale of displacement from Syria dwarfed that from all other countries, as you can see on this map. And as you'll remember, Canadians responded really generously at that time. And in a very short period, Canada, through a combination of community and government efforts, resettled 58,650 people who had fled that Syrian conflict. And Lethbridge took in more than 400 people during that time. So what do Canada's numbers look like in the global context? Here are some current details on the status of displaced people globally, as reported by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR, which is the UN agency with responsibility for refugees and people in refugee-like situations. And this organization releases an annual report every June that collates the data globally um, on displacement for the previous calendar year. So according to this report, 2019 saw the highest level of displacement on record. So that is since comprehensive statistics on global forced uh, displacement have been collected. And I should note that the figures that you see on the slide here are of people who received UNHCR assistance. So it doesn't actually capture everyone who was displaced, because as we know, not everyone would have managed to find their way to assistance. So last year, 2019, saw 79.5 million people forcibly displaced worldwide, which is the highest level ever. In 2019, there were 11 million people who were newly displaced, so you get the sense that there are some longer standing situations of displacement globally as well. And this is the seventh year in a row that the total number of refugees under the UNHCR mandate has increased to the point that one out of every 97 people globally or 1% of the global population is currently displaced, right? Staggering numbers. Now, globally, displacement continues to be a major issue in both scale and scope, as you can tell from those numbers. And it's not just the Syrian crisis, although that is still at the top of the list in 2019 for countries of origin, as you can see on this slide. Um, but as you see here, the displacement of Venezuelans continue to be a major concern as well in 2019. And it's not just the Mediterranean route through which people are fleeing that became so part of the public consciousness during the Syrian crisis. Although more than 2,000 people died in 2018 trying to make that crossing, and almost 2,000 in 2019. So a crucial part of the global picture is that, in fact, 77% of the world's refugees are living in what are called protracted refugee situations which means that their displacements or their situations of experiencing being a refugee have lasted for five years or more, and in many cases, much longer than that. So pictured here is Dadaab refugee camp, 
which has hosted refugees primarily from Somalia and Sudan since 1991. Located in eastern Kenya, about 100 kilometers from the border with Somalia, it was originally meant to provide short-term shelter to about 90,000 people. But by 2011, so uh, 20 years after it had come into existence, it had a population of 480,000 people, right? Like five times the size of Lethbridge's population. And today there are still 235,000 people registered in this refugee camp. Right? And so I think it's important to recognize this because there's an understanding that situations of displacement are temporary or short term or only emergency kind of situations. When in fact, we see from these numbers that 77% of people who are displaced globally have been displaced for more than five years without a solution in sight. Right? So most become protracted refugee situations. And while this exhibit focuses on Canada's role in responding to refugees, the global picture tells a broader story, right? So who actually hosts the majority of the world's refugees? You can see on this slide here, the top international displacement situations by, country, by host country. So that's the country where people arrive as refugees. And a really important point here to notice is that 85% of the world's displaced people are hosted in what's known as the global south or less economically developed countries, right? And this is a staggering figure and makes Canada's really important contributions kind of pale in comparison, right? And so the concept and the possibility of resettlement to Canada exists because of this large global disparity or unevenness in the geography of where people are actually displaced to uh, when they're fleeing conflicts or fleeing persecution. Right? So as you see here, some countries bear a very heavy responsibility in relation to the ongoing and multiple refugee crises. Um, so for example, Turkey and Colombia are currently the top two countries who are hosting displaced people. So in a sense, Canada is a bit protected by its geography, right? It's sort of harder to get here and we're not located beside countries that have been experiencing conflicts in the same way. And so Canada has, has and makes use of the luxury to actually choose often who arrives inside its borders. And so the, the main way in which Canada contributes to the global refugee regime is through what's known as resettlement, which, was, which is one of the main uh, sort of, it's called durable solutions that the UN Refugee Agency en envisions for people who are displaced. And, so, and resettlement is part of the refugee regime, but there's actually no legal obligation for states to engage in it. And Canada has been a leader in this area for a long time. Right, especially through its private sponsorship of refugees program. But I would argue that it's not enough because as you can see here on this slide, and this is just a snapshot of the, of the large, much larger number of, peop of people who are displaced globally, but there are 1.4 million people in uh, 2019 that the UN Refugee Agency identified as in urgent need of resettlement but there were only 107,800 people who were actually resettled to 26 resettlement countries in that year, right? So the need is great and the number of settlement spaces or resettlement spaces in different countries is quite limited, right? But even on that scale, Canada has done quite well. So in 2019, Canada resettled more than 30,000 people. Um, but the number of people who are being resettled has gone down dramatically over the last few years due in large part to the fact that, that the United States has dramatically reduced its resettlement places. So I just wanna end by saying that this exhibit is quite timely, right? Despite arriving during a global pandemic when most countries have closed their borders to non-citizens, this exhibit reminds us of Canada's long history in connection to the emergence of the global refugee regime. And while it has led on several fronts, including developing the gender guidelines and claims on the basis of sexual orientation and gender persecution, as well as through the long-standing private sponsorship of refugee program that has been studied and is now being emulated by countries around the world, the exhibit also reminds us of those times and cases where Canada's response fell a bit short, right? Including refusing admission to Jewish refugees on the St. Louis prior to the Second World War, and the more recent implementation of the Safe Third Country Agreement 
that has twice been ruled by the courts to contravene the Constitution, and which makes it much harder to make your way to Canada and make a refugee claim. But I think the exhibit also encourages us to think about the role that the country could play in continuing to uphold its international legal obligations and providing an example to other countries uh, that would insist on the right to asylum and the importance of mobility in a globalized world. Thank you. So this discussion complements our current exhibition, Refuge Canada, which was created and circulated by the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 and sponsored by TD Bank. Today we're talking about the importance of examining local histories and geographies to understanding Canada's broader experiences with refuge. I'm here with Dr. Julie Young, Assistant Professor in the Department of Geography and Environment and Canada Research Chair Tier 2 in Critical Border Studies at the University of Lethbridge. So I'll start by asking you to introduce yourself and your research programs. Great, thanks so much, Amy, and thanks to the GALT uh, for inviting me to contribute to this exhibit. My research critically in engages with the dynamics of migration and border policies in Canada and globally. Um, and my, so the title of my research chair is Critical Border Studies. Some people ask what that means. It's not only the most important borders. It's this idea that borders are more than just lines on the ground, that they are actually dynamic and in process, right? That they don't only demarcate the distinctions between different nation states, but they are more complex um, than that, right? So borders are understood as a set of practices and bordering is an ongoing process that's carried out by a range of actors through different spaces and relationships. And so as a geographer, I'm really interested in examining those different conceptualizations of borders, the different spaces in which they play out and the different actors or different people involved in them. Um, so I sort of say that my research program aims to understand how larger political and economic processes play out on the ground, so sort of in a more grounded, localized way, and what those local practices and expressions mean for how we can relate to and study and potentially shift those structures. And I do so by spending time in communities around the Canada-US and the Mexico-Guatemala border, with people who navigate these migration and border control policies and practices in their daily lives. So really trying to understand how policies play out on the ground in practice and how they are lived experiences in addition to these sort of overarching policies. Mm -hmm. So at the GALT, we have a mandate to collect uh, local stories and experiences and communicate th those histories. So in thinking about this current exhibition, Refuge Canada, why do you think it's important to examine those local histories and geographies um, of refuge? Great, thanks. Great question. Um, so one of the things I would say is that place really matters, right? And we're both geographers here or trained as geographers. And so we sort of take that for granted. But I think most people can relate to that, right? That place does matter when we're talking about the experience of being displaced or the experience of finding or seeking refuge. Because for example, if you think about someone arriving in Lethbridge as a refugee versus arriving in Calgary or Ottawa or Montreal, those are very different contexts of arrival and of settlement, right? And so people are gonna have very different experiences. And so it's important to look at those, at the distinctions, but also the similarities across those different places um, and across time as well, right? The different histories. Because the differences between Lethbridge and Calgary, for example, could be in terms of infrastructure, right? In terms of transit or housing, um, in terms of the accessibility of the political process, sort of local municipal politics. But it could also be in terms of local employment opportunities, local educational opportunities, and then even existing communities or networks, right? So whether those are religious or ethno-racial of longstanding or more recent, all of those are going to shape that place and the experience of arriving in that place. And of course, histories of migration also make a difference, right? So does this place have a history in relation to refugee resettlement, for example? Or are there significant segments of the population who have arrived in, in our example, Lethbridge from a particular country um, who have settled in this place? And then also, what is the ongoing legacy of indigenous displacement and dispossession that's very present here? How does this relate to these settler and migration histories, right? And so I always talk of, or think about it in this way, when people migrate to a new country, they don't actually arrive in the nation state, 
right? They arrive in a city or a town, and so they experience that place and it project it onto the larger understanding of what it means to find refuge in Canada. So I think it's really important to look at these local histories because they tell us, you know, they can tell us really much more nuanced and co complicated stories mm -hmm. about the experience of refuge. So I just, I did want to flag, because I'm from the university, just flag a couple of really exciting projects by a couple of graduate students that are happening right now. Um, so Mariah Bestplug, who is an MA student in the geography department, is actually doing a project focusing on the experiences of Lethbridge area sponsors and refugees working with the private sponsorship of refugee program. So that's an exciting project to look out for. Then there's also Wael Nasser, who is also an MA candidate in the Department of Geography, whose research focuses on the use of technologies by Nigerian asylum seekers as they try to navigate the Canada-US border. And then finally, Rabindra Chalagane, who is a PhD student in the Cultural, Social and Political Thought program, is working with Nepali-speaking Bhutanese refugees resettled to Lethbridge over the past decade. So these are, I think, really exciting projects, two of which have very localized um, implications. And I think, you know, if people are interested, they should look out for uh, the results of those studies coming out over the next couple of years. Um, and then I, so I could also talk a little bit about some of the work that I'm doing that uh, sponsored by the National Geographic Society through a project called Remembering Refuge. Can you talk a little bit more about that project? For sure. Um, so it's a project that I'm engaged with with a couple of collaborators um, in Ontario, actually, Grace Wu and Joanna Reynolds. Um, and as I mentioned, it's funded by the National Geographic Society through their Documenting Human Migrations project, which is a really exciting project. We weren't sure if they were looking for the kinds of stories that we were telling, um, but we were interested in developing a multimedia we're calling it a counter archive, so a different kind of archive capturing different stories of the Canada-US border told through the stories of people originally from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Haiti, who between uh, the 1980s and 2018 have experienced crossing the Canada-US border, right? And so really we're trying to offer a different version of the history of that border that then is told through official archives, right? And official policy maker stories. Because we're really interested in deepening understandings about how the histories of displacement and the construction of the Canada-US border are intertwined in the Americas. And so really what we're hoping to do with this project is to center the experiences of people who have been displaced across multiple borders in the Americas as narrators of key periods in Canada's history, right? So in this way, we're sort of making those stories foundational to rather than peripheral to the histories and the stories that are captured and told about the Canada-US border. And so we're in the midst of developing this, what will be an online open access resource with educational materials for secondary and post-secondary educators, and we're hoping to launch that project sometime later this fall. Wow. Yeah. Well, that sounds wonderful. So, and I think it's very relevant, again, to the content that's explored in this exhibition. So I hope a lot of people uh, continue to follow your research and take the opportunity to come and see Refuge Canada while it's here in Lethbridge. So thank you again, Dr. Young, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity.